Can life only exist on Earth-like worlds? The discovery of the first confirmed exoplanet or planet outside our solar system in 1995 got researchers to seriously believe that we may just find life out there. Why not? Now that isn't a scientific response, but life is incredibly improbable. The amount of crazy flukes that enabled life to appear on Earth is incredible. It seems everything had to be just right or life just never would have happened. Just like the proverbial bowl of porridge, which actually leads to the topic of this video. A certain famous little girl of fairy tale fame lent her name to the region around a star at which liquid water can exist. This Goldilocks zone is the distance from a star, a sweet spot where liquid water can exist. To be more precise, it is a function of stellar luminosity and output. What does that mean? It means that the more energetic star is, the further out its Goldilocks or habitable zone is. Now that's an extremely basic criteria for a planet to be livable, but it's a star. Life exists here partly because we have to be just the right distance from our sun. Because life has only been found here, as far as we're aware, we naturally think that life will tend to favour Earth-like conditions somewhere else. That does make some sense. However, does all life in the universe necessarily exist on a rocky, watery world that essentially is just another Earth? It may not have to be the case. Much recent thinking has been directed towards redefining the habitable zone. Our solar system is one of countless billions estimated to exist in our galaxy alone. As researchers discover more exosolar systems, it's becoming apparent that maybe our corner of the galaxy is actually quite unusual. For astrobiology to start kicking goals, it's important to think outside the square. For that reason, we take a look at the habitable zone as we know it and stretch its limits. Beginning with... The local. In our solar system, we see a bunch of objects. Moons, asteroids, planets, and more. Many of these planets are suspected to possess water. Lots of it. In fact, it's believed by many researchers that the amount of water in the solar system not situated on Earth is quite large. You wouldn't think it, but Earth is actually really dry compared to many other worlds in our solar system. As a matter of fact, it's a little bit of a mystery as to why Earth's water content is so low. For example, one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, is smaller than Earth's moon but may hide two to three times more water than Earth. Europa is one of a small group of worlds in the solar system that may have conditions and environments suitable for the presence of life. Not just habitability, as was possibly the case with our own moon, but biogenesis. What is this? It comes from the words bios meaning life and genesis meaning creation. It literally means creation of life. The reason these worlds give astrobiologists hope is that, quite naturally, alien solar systems probably come in all shapes and sizes. Moons like Europa, Enceladus, or even now quite dead worlds such as Venus and Mars throw us glimmers of hope that Earth-based life is not alone in the universe. These worlds, and others we discover, often possess sets of conditions assumed to be completely hostile to life as we know it. However, even life, as we know it, has shown us that it can really go off script sometimes. Extremophiles such as tardigrades are organisms able to withstand conditions fatal to most other life. The word extremophile comes from extremo and file, meaning lover. Literally, these organisms love extreme conditions and thrive in them. New extremophiles are still being uncovered in some really nasty corners of the world. They show one thing. Life's ability to evolve and adapt enables it to live almost anywhere. These organisms have been found in space, in nuclear reactors, and even deep in the Earth's mantle. Microorganisms have recently been discovered in Antarctica, which literally use hydrogen itself as a food source. 
Such organisms suggest that the old idea of a habitable zone, the right amount of heat, light and atmosphere as we observe on Earth, need not necessarily apply to exoplanets. Highly locked exoplanets. These are worlds that orbit a star that don't rotate like Earth. Instead, like our moon always has one side always facing Earth, these planets have one side permanently facing their star. What does this mean? The side facing the star obviously receives much more light and heat than the planet's night side. Translation, it is likely a scorched wasteland where temperatures are oven-like. On the dark side, we expect to find extremes of temperature at the opposite end of the scale. This side will be frozen and permanently dark. Overall, the planet doesn't seem to hold much hope for life. It is believed that a good percentage of exoplanets are locked into tight orbits around their stars. Often in these worlds take a few days, or even less, to complete an orbit, and they are most likely tidally locked as a result. But all hope is not lost. The discovery of water ice in permanently shadowed craters on worlds as hostile as Mercury and our Moon leads many researchers to suggest that similar regions could exist on tidally locked exoplanets. Such water-filled regions would lie within the Terminator, the boundary between a planet's day and night side. On a larger object, such as an exoplanet, small strips of habitability could exist, situated in literally a permanent twilight zone. These shadowy zones of habitability could be a surprising spot for life to appear or emerge. In such a situation, the habitable zone as we define it would not be as dependent on distance from a star. No habitable zone? The recent discovery of two rogue planets lends itself to another interesting scenario. These rogue worlds are planets or other objects which aren't gravitationally bound to a solar system. They are believed to be quite common. Current estimates have the complement of wandering worlds in the Milky Way galaxy at approximately 2 billion. How could such exotic locations possibly host life? Because geothermal or tidal heating could provide conditions in which simple life could emerge. Tidal heating is a mechanism for internal heating which has been observed in several frozen distant worlds in our own solar system. Europa, mentioned before, and Enceladus likely possess subsurface oceans of liquid briny water. The heating for this comes from the gravitational stresses caused by interactions with nearby worlds. In the case of Europa for example, its elliptical or oval shaped orbit around Jupiter causes an ebb and flow of tidal flexion in its rocky core. This creates a lot of friction that heats the core. This heat may even give rise to fissures and hydrothermal vents, providing possible starting places for life as may have been the case here on Earth. Now, these frozen worlds appear lifeless, but appearances could be deceiving. Whilst far beyond the habitable zone of this solar system, the presence of life on these moons would lead to further redefinition of habitable zones. Exoplanets are believed to number in the trillions in this galaxy, and the recent discovery of the first known exomoon suggests that moons could be even more numerous. After all, in our solar system, Moons and natural satellites outnumber the planets by 10 to 1. Habitability on any of these worlds opens up the options for researchers observing distant solar systems for signs of life. Last but not least, a benchmark of habitability as we define it for Earth-based life is that overall the environment should be stable in order for life to have a chance. Earth itself only became habitable after billions of years of incredible geological upheaval and bombardment from outer space. The gradual emergence of a thick atmosphere afforded protection from cosmic rays pumped out by a young sun. A class of exoplanets known as super-Earths may be able to support life despite often being in orbit around extremely energetic stars such as red dwarfs. These stellar objects are tiny, often having only 10% of the mass of our own sun, but they are nasty. Frequently red dwarfs have been observed producing extreme solar flare activity. This image shows a solar flare being generated by the red dwarf star DG Canum Venaticorum, or DG CVM for short. To put it in perspective, the most powerful solar flare ever observed on our own sun was rated X45 on a standard scale used to gauge flare events. In comparison, the DG CVM solar flare was rated X100,000, making it 10,000 times more powerful. At its peak, 
the day you see the inflare event reach temperatures 12 times hotter than the core of our sun. So it stands to reason that any nearby planets will be baked into oblivion by the levels of energy being reduced during such events. But larger rocky worlds such as super earths could provide a slim chance of life. Super earths are rocky worlds ranging in size from 3 to 5 times larger than earth. Their mantle and outer layers could act literally as a shield against radiation, enabling any life form present to carry on in subsurface biospheres, akin to recently discovered microbial biospheres deep in the Earth's crust. Lifeless surfaces could hide thriving ecosystems throughout the galaxy, or even beyond. Even neutron stars could harbour life bearing worlds, if conditions are just right. These stellar objects don't seem like an ideal location for anything to exist, but again, a suitably large and dense world could provide safe harbour against lethal X-rays and other extreme radiation. Small worlds could be destroyed if they spray too close, but if a super Earth lay at a safe distance, who knows? A final thought. In this overview, it's been shown that life can theoretically exist outside the traditional rules we set for life here. However, I've only looked at planet-based life. Who knows what else is out there? And that's a whole new way of thinking. Thanks for watching Astrobiological, bringing you the universe of plain human. I'll see you next time.